So, your uncle. What's wrong with him? He's possessed. As in the devil? Something like that. He says a dark man is following him. Watching him at all times. What do you make of it? It's nonsense, of course. But I'd be lying if I said it didn't bother me. You see, it runs in my family. Possession? No, detective. Deteriorating melancholy. Practically every member of the Hartwood family is driven mad before they grow old. But Jeremy didn't kill himself. Is that why he's at your setup? Despite being convinced that he is truly possessed, he decided to put his last chips on Dr. Gray and his psychoanalysis, figuring he might stumble upon some cure. You mentioned the letter. I received a disturbing letter from Jeremy accusing the staff and all the other patients of being involved in some cult. And now they are also out to get him. Could it be real? Or is it all just in his head? It's a story he tells himself, Mr. Carnby. Anything to avoid the truth. Which is? That we're all terribly insignificant. That people mean so very little to one another. That there is no one out to get Jeremy Hartwood because he isn't worth getting. And here we are. My uncle's not well, Mr. Carnby. I want to make sure he's all right. Then what's my part in this? You couldn't get a cab? I just wouldn't feel safe going alone. Did you bring a gun? Yeah. You think it'll actually come to that? No. But you might need to wave it around depending on how agreeable the staff will be. What exactly are we going to do when we find Jeremy? I don't know. Let's just find him first. Hello? Hello? Looks abandoned. It can't be. There has to be someone around. Wait here. I'll go around back. Desetto, the old plantation building, was ready to fall, but kept alive by some starry-eyed carpetbagger called Dr. Gray. Seeing how the staff couldn't even be bothered with answering the door, Detective Comby figured they would just head inside and grab Jeremy. He just needed to open the front door for Emily first, so she could talk to her uncle. Now what do we got here?
Nah, I'm not getting in there. Mind if I do? Every day your silence weighs a little heavier. It's been a difficult year for everyone, and many have lost all hope. I read in the papers about people suffering. Pictures of dust-covered landscapes without a drop of water. I wish I knew if you were still tending the earth or if you had turned your back against us. I have started to look for help elsewhere. I pray you will tell me if I am going down a path that you find disagreeable. With help from Batiste and Charlotte, I found comfort in the practice of the voodoo. I have long been skeptical of that Caribbean cult, but... It's been of good use to me. It seems all harmless in my book. I say some words dreamt up by the Creoles, and I carry around a small pocket of gris, gris Nothing of this is mentioned in the Bible, of course, but the French quarter priestess tells me it's all connected. She says the Christian God is just one more perspective on the creator of things. That's what I like to think, but the other way around, that the spirits of her faith are just aspects of you, our Heavenly Father. I am so grateful for the words you gave Mr. Hartwood. We will sing your praises at St. John's Eve. The world will be blessed soon again. Only the sacrifices of the Old Testament compare to your demands. Let it be the truth. A mother of earth wood and dirt, a mother of a thousand young. Sacred sand, one dollar. Black cat oil, dollar fifty. Devil shoe strings, a quarter. That makes two dollars and seventy-five cents, madame. What was that you were telling the doctor? A goat without horns. What does that mean? Ah, you must have misheard me, madame. I said no such thing. Please, I know I don't look like any of you, but I'm devout. I'm ready to do what it takes. Mm, do not be so eager to sacrifice the few things you have left, madam. Now please, leave my store. A goat without horns.
was that? Please do not touch the boiler. It is working after all. While the sabotage has caused a leak, only the decorative plate has been completely ruined. Let's wait for Mr. Chance to turn up and he can take a look at the leak. Mr. Waits. That doesn't look safe. There's something missing. Sunday, June 22nd. I spent all day looking for Jeremy. I should have cared for the others, but I'm scared that he will do something irreversible. Cassandra is upset that I didn't give her the latest shipment of pain medication that Waits brought from the post office yesterday. I would have given it to her, but the company didn't send a new key this time around, so the box is just sitting there on my desk. They must have figured we had plenty of their gimmicky keys by now. I only remember seeing one lately. Grace was playing with it inside the grand parlor. Unless it turns up by itself, it will have to wait. I have to figure out where Jeremy is. I think Jack knew something. That dog of his found a strange rot permeating the house. She's showing us, he said. Like those blots and streaks of fetid rot was talking to him.
The Great Depression. President Hoover raises tariffs on over 20,000 imported goods in an act to protect American labor. Following the collapse of the Wall Street stock market on October 24 last year, American industry has suffered greatly. Thousands of companies have gone bankrupt and left a large part of the American workforce unemployed. In an attempt to turn the tide, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act has been signed by President Herbert Hoover. By regulating commerce with foreign countries, the government hopes to encourage the industries of the United States to compete with cheap foreign imports. Superstition on Rise New Orleans voodoo stores and spiritual mediums see increased profit during troubled times. While the market has faced hard times ever since Black Thursday of last year, voodoo doctors and snake charmers see significant rise in number of customers. With the coming eve of St. John on the 23rd, the police expect increased cult activity around Bayou St. John, the southern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. Voodoo rituals in that area on the eve of St. John have a long tradition reaching back to the first snake worshippers brought as slaves from West Africa. During the 19th century, its practice was popularized by the legendary Marie Laveau and has since been embraced by many of the Creoles and a surviving aristocracy of the French Quarter. Author Seeks Asylum Rumors regarding author Cassandra Beauregard making Dorsetto her home verified. Dorsetto Hospital is an old plantation building on the eastern shores of Lake Pontchartrain. While often considered an asylum for the insane, residing Dr. Elmore Lee Gray prefers to think of it as a convalescent home, a place where you can go to rest. The patient list is kept secret, but thought to include many of the black sheep of wealthy families, because at Dorsetto, treatment does not come for free. Local author Cassandra Beauregard has now been confirmed by her own admission. She's been lauded as a powerful Creole voice and written many successful books. Lately it was reported from Hollywood that she has finished a moving picture manuscript titled Slaughter Gulch. That film is set to hit the theaters next year. Thanks. What are you doing? Who are you? Whoa, pardon me, excuse me. My name is Edward Carnby, private investigator. I hope you don't mind we let ourselves inside. I do mind. This is private property. You can't just barge in here. I'm sorry about all this, but I'm looking for my uncle. It's urgent, and no one was answering the door. We can't hear you knocking anymore. None of us can. Who is your uncle, darling? Jeremy. Am I right? She has that Hartwood gloom, doesn't she? That's right. I'm Emily Hartwood. I just came to make sure my uncle is alright. Well, he is unavailable right now. He will have to come back another day. Unavailable? How? Is he sleeping? We can wait. He's lost. Don't I know you from somewhere? Who's your man again, Miss Hartwood? My name's Edward Carnby. Private investigator. Splendid. Enough! All of you, get back to your rooms. McCarthy, keep your eyes on the child. And you two, please leave immediately. Look, we're not here to cause any trouble. Just let us see the old man, satisfy the curiosity of my client here, and we'll be off. Jeremy has gone missing. There's no need to worry, but it might be some time before he turns up. The whole staff is looking for him. What? He ran off? I don't have time for any of this. Please, come back tomorrow. All right, in that case, we'll just wait in his room. You don't mind, do you? It's upstairs, right? Wait, you can't. Don't worry, we'll be discreet. In the corridor, it's the first door on your left. I'll tell Dr. Gray you're here. Excellent, thank you, madam. Let's look around, see if we can pick up any clues.
Jeremy had gone missing. The housekeeper said the staff at Dossetto was looking for him, and that Detective Conby and Emily should come back tomorrow. Hoping to wrap up this case before leaving, Conby hustled his way inside Jeremy's room, leaving the housekeeper flustered and running for Dr. Gray, the chief of Dossetto. Having bought some time, this was the perfect opportunity to look for clues regarding Jeremy's disappearance. Anything important I should look out for? Did he keep a diary? Not that I know of, but it wouldn't surprise me. Quite the artist, your uncle. Paintings, sculptures. I don't know much about modern art, but he seems dedicated. Jeremy is a fairly well-known landscape painter in New Orleans. You've probably seen more of his work than you realize. We should go talk to the doctor that the housekeeper mentioned. Dr. Gray? I suppose. Let's just do a little more digging first, okay? Sure. No rush. Every night the dark man stands opaque at the threshold of my room, counting the days until my spirit spills out of my tired shape. Only his pallid mask shelters my remaining sanity. Staring directly into the face of that demonic sultan would surely sunder time itself. Would he have looked the same to my father as he struggled for his life? Does his veiled face haunt my niece quite the same way? I wish so that I could rest my soul in that sunburnt convent of Tarawaya. Would I find you there, Juan? Or Senora Perosi? back from the beyond. Every night I hide from him, moving from one misshapen memory to another. Seems conjured out of fantasy and delirium. Places I struggle to even paint. I wish I understood your death, Signora. Is there anything I could do for you but bury you in that bleak necropolis? That triumphant chapel rising above the ledges and the oven vaults shall be your sepulchre, where you may rest, and I shall weep. How did you first come to understand such things, Signora? How did you know that the battered boil in the basement would lead me to Lafayette Cemetery? Or how the old upstairs clock, with its astronomical motifs, would take me to that hateful mound outside of Claremont Harbor? Those are my memories, my past. Is there perhaps a chance, if ever so small, for me to see Tarawaya? Oh, I want that more than anything. Please, let my talisman take me there. Let me sit with Juan under his Bodhi tree. Despite having sold me that talisman, Miss Jackson, the voodoo priestess, revealed none of her secrets to me. That's why I had to travel to Tonka. Instead, she cruelly told Baptiste, my caretaker, that he would be betrayed and killed in the most awful way, that the one he loved would pierce his thigh with a sharp spear, and that he would be devoured by his own mother. What a terrible thing to say. The people of DeSetto were becoming dangerous. They do not understand what they are doing. I must do something to stop him. I tried talking to Dr. Gray, but he confuses my worries. He's caught up in treating me. How can he expect evil to be cured with medicine and conversation? The orderlies, the housekeeper, and the patients are all deranged. They will call upon evil to enter this world. All will be lost. Everything. Unless I can find the clerk, Mr. Waite. He seems to be a clear-thinking man. Maybe Beauregard. The dark man offered me a prison, and I accepted. I signed that miscarried contract and entered the dark pact. 
Everyone is safe, except for me. I found a book full of peculiar notes. Have you heard of something called Tarawea? No. What's that? I might be reading too much into this, but I think it's the place he wants to go to. Oh, okay. Sounds like a clue. Hey, you know anything about this? Looks like some sort of talisman. No, I don't. Oh, help me out here, will you? I want to kill the guy, throw some of this stuff out? I'd be crazy too if I had this much junk lying around. save this one. All right, come on. I want to go see Dr. Gray. Come on, let's go. Yeah, I'm coming. Miss Hartwood. Emily? What the hell is going on? Where am I? Detective Condy couldn't believe his eyes. The French Quarter scene before him was dark and sinister. The only sign of life he could see from Jeremy's balcony was the light coming from a lone corner store. Yeah. Christ, what the hell was that? Ah!
can't go that way. What the hell is going on? I can't go that way. Let them get inside our convair. They're not the good kind. Are you... Is this your store? There are no owners here. We both strangers in Jeremy's store. Jeremy did this? How? The pack with the dog, man. Jeremy warned us, but we didn't think much of it. I'm Detective Edward Carnby. I was hired by Jeremy's niece to find him. Oh, yeah? How much you paying you? $150? <laughs> She's sure getting her money's worth tonight. Are you a thinking man, compare? No, nah, not if I can help it. You know, I think Jeremy's hiding in a way we can't find him. He has this juju necklace that guides him. The talisman? That's right. It's some magic charm he got for Miss Jackson down the street. The voodoo priestess? You know surprising things, compare. Yeah, the mama lower. Here, take the key. I locked the gate to save her place from all the ghouls and goblins getting inside. Maybe if you go there, you can find some clues to show you the way. Thanks. I'll have a look. Detective Combe hesitated to buy into the stranger's explanation, but it was all he had. Baptiste, this mountain of a man, seemed to suggest that this other world they had been pulled into was built from Jeremy's scattered memories. It sounded crazy to him, but Combe couldn't exactly deny the situation he found himself in. Baptiste believed Jeremy was able to move freely between worlds using a talisman he got from Miss Jackson, a voodoo witch doctor that made a good living from alleviating the rich from their ailments and their money. In hope to find Jeremy, or way back to DeSetto, Combe set out to investigate Miss Jackson's place. Detective Conby had seen plenty of violence before, but nothing quite like this. What was that cursed thing? You want to come along? Nah, I'm going to stay here for a while. Anything I can do for... Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Batiste. Just tell my sister Lottie I'm all right if you see her. All right, I'm heading out. Be careful out there.
Okay. can't go that way. Miss Jackson's seance parlor. Let's see if she's got any information on Jeremy's talisman. He recognized this place. It was Miss Jackson's seance room. The last time he was here, he had been trying to figure out the significance of wasps' nests and horse hair wrapped up in red silk. An image of a dead woman stabbed with 
hat pins flashed inside his mind. Conley shuddered. This was no time to dwell on the past. He needed to find out about the talisman and get back to Desetto. like the one in the painting. I think it's meant for the talisman. I think it needs numbers, like coordinates. Maybe there's something in Jeremy's notes. It's showing something. A place? Where is that? Detective, I was wondering when you were going to show up. Mrs. Thompson told me you were here. I understand you are working for Jeremy Hartwood's niece. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you're not wrong. We came here for her uncle. I just didn't expect... I didn't expect this. You are Dr. Gray, right? That's right. You don't happen to have some identification, Detective. I'm not keen on having strangers prying into my business. Oh, Detective Edward Carnby, Decatur Street, New Orleans. Enjoying the view carré, Detective? Those old French quarters, the voodoo people, the gangsters. I'm sure you live an exciting life. Well, it's not quite like the stories, Doc. Just trying to make a living. Aren't we all making a living? Well, welcome to Dosetto, Detective. I hope your time here will be useful. Now, what can I do for you? Why don't you tell me where I can find Jeremy Hartwood? <laughs> Why wouldn't that make for a short visit? I wish I could tell you, but I'm afraid I don't know. A drink, Detective? Anything brandy. Oh, you do belong in the French quarters, Detective. Armagnac or cognac? You know, just give me the cheap stuff. I'm not much of a connoisseur. Having low standards is not a virtue, detective. Let me see if I can broaden your perspective. What can you tell me about Jeremy? I wouldn't want to go into details about his condition. Doctor-patient confidentiality. I'm sure you understand. Sure. But he is crazy. And he's gone missing. Why? Here, try this. Ooh, it's good. Got a bite? <laughs> it's called a sidecar. The trick is not to be afraid of the tartness of the lemon. Then, for goodness sake, don't overdo the triple sec. Okay, what can you tell me about Jeremy? Ah, oh, well, let me think. He is an anxious man, constantly worried about events not presenting themselves according to his model of predestination. He complains about things not being carried out in the right order, and that some things simply shouldn't be. Is any of this helpful to you? Uh, not really. Uh, I was hoping for some direction where to look next. I'm sorry. I have nothing for you, then. You should talk to my orderlies. They have been looking for him for a while. 
I'm sure they would appreciate your help. Yeah, I ran into Batiste earlier. Come to think of it, he... He might have given me a lead. Oh, excellent. So your investigation is already underway. I'm gonna go. But I'm sure we'll meet again. Looking forward to it. Safe returns. Detective Carnby, how did you... where did you go? I was just talking to Dr. Gray. You disappeared. No, it's not what you think. Have you... have you found anything strange going on here? Yes. Everyone is being incredibly evasive and I can't figure out why. No, I mean something you can't explain. Paranormal, even. Detective? I really need you to get yourself together. I can't do this alone. Forget it. I'll figure it out. Do you want to come see Dr. Gray? No. I want to I want to try something else. With his talisman, I think I can follow Jeremy, the place he mentioned in the book. What was the name? Do you remember something Spanish? T Taroea. Yeah, that's where I need to go. Detective? Are you going to be all right? Yeah. Of course. Go talk to Dr. Gray. We'll rendezvous later. This talisman brought me back from the French Quarter in the blink of an eye. If Jeremy can travel so easily, then he could be hiding anywhere, even Tarawea. If he can do it, so can I. I just need to figure out how the talisman works. While Detective Combi was grateful to be back at Decetto, he was eager to test his hypothesis. After having suffered through that sinister world, dressed as the French Quarter, Jeremy's writing could be read much more literally. What if Jeremy used his talisman to actually visit those places he mentioned in the book? Conby felt certain that this was the answer. He wouldn't find Jeremy hiding inside Decetto. He would be in one of those other worlds. And to follow in his steps, Conby would have to investigate the old clock and the boiler and find out what part they played. Paul, you're right about the plates on the boiler and the clock. They have been sabotaged, and I think I know who did it. They have something to do with Jeremy's episodes and how he seems to disappear at night. Right now, it's important that you keep an eye out for any of the pieces. I want to find out if I can repair the plates. Let me know if you find any of them. Lottie. Tell Lottie to take a look at the well in the kitchen garden. Dr. Elmore Lee Gray is DeSetto's chief doctor. Accounting and all administrative work is handled by me, Paul Waits. Magdalena Thompson, or Mags, is responsible for the household. Jean-Baptiste and Charlotte Tabois are responsible for keeping the guests' medical regiments in check. Finally, Jack Chance is our gardener, who can occasionally be seen in the conservatory, but is, for the most part, busy outside. There are currently six guests at Dosetto. Malcolm McCarthy and Ruth Talant reside on the first floor. Jeremy Hartwood, Elisabetta Perosi, Grace Saunders, and of course, Cassandra Beauregard live on the second floor.
saw your notice in the boiler room. You should know Mr. Chance won't be coming back. I got no business being in there myself, but you can take a vow from the wine cellar if you want to try to stop the steam pouring out. Be careful. There's no way I can get into this thing. Better leave it alone. Cassandra Beauregard, the beloved offer. Very exciting, isn't it? What do you want to put down for reason for admission? What her agent told us. Cassandra suffers from a writer's block and needs to finish her moving picture script before the end of June. Mr. Chardot suggests Cassandra's heavy use of barbiturates is holding her back and risks ruining her career. And how should we summarize her personal history? Let's keep it short. Cassandra Beauregard is a beloved crime author who managed to pull herself out of poverty and into stardom. Five years ago, she tried killing herself by jumping off a balcony. The incident left her a cripple and now relies heavily on her wheelchair. And for diagnostic impressions? Cassandra suffers chronic back pain following her suicide attempt. She self-administers morphine to keep herself ambulant, but has become addicted and the desired effect is now lost. The drug abuse clouds her mind, and she is unable to focus on real life. To save herself from this insight, she instead makes up stories to fill out the gaps in her own thought process, resembling the Korsakoff Syndrome. Oh, bravo, Doctor. How will you treat her? First of all, she needs to be weaned from her drug addiction, and hopefully it will resolve her compulsive lying. Then look into permanently numbing her pain in her back through surgery. Finally, deal with her suicidal thoughts. Fantastic. With such a short time before June, I really hope she gets better soon. We will do what we can. Grace Saunders, 11 years old. Reason for admission? The mother insists on strict supervision by a proper gentleman to avoid further perversion of Grace's adolescence. Personal history? Grace's family possesses modest wealth and status. Her childhood seems ordinary, spending most of her time with private teachers and family friends. Grace's father recently passed away, leaving her mother the sole caregiver. And diagnostic impressions? Grace has trouble dealing with her father's death. She is willingly suppressing her feelings on the matter and isn't properly acknowledging the trauma she suffered. Any planned treatment? Grace needs nothing out of the ordinary. She simply needs parental guidance. Eventually, we can work on her feelings toward her father. Thank you, Doctor. I'll finish the paperwork and get her installed. Malcolm McCarthy, 54 years of age. Reason for admission? McCarthy admitted himself to Dossetto, stating simply that he needs some damn rest. And personal history. McCarthy claims he used to work as a lawyer in Baton Rouge, but says he can't go into details because of some legal dispute. His background remains largely a mystery, except for the occasional clue that he drops in conversation. Huh. And diagnostic impressions. McCarthy is an anxious man and an alcoholic. He often tells half-truths due to some deep-seated inability to trust other people. And how will you treat that? McCarthy will take some time to open up. Spending time with Jack's dog or the child should be good for him. Their harmless nature will help build his sense of trust. Thank you, Doctor. Elisabetta Perosi, 33 years old? What should I put down as reason for admission? Well, Perosi broke into Dorsetto and was found wandering the grand parlor. She was confused and suffered partial amnesia. She insisted she belonged here and offered to pay for her stay. Right. What do you make of her story? Perosi claims to have been a member of the Astarte artist colony some twenty years ago. A claim that seems contrafactual due to her young age. 
She looks to be, and even thinks she is, 33 years of age. That would make her a child at the time. It seems fair to say that Perosi's story is untrue. Deliberately so or not. Diagnostic impressions? Do you have anything? Perosi's story is peculiar, because she retracted her story about the artist colony. She no longer claims to be the same person as Elisabetta Perosi. However, my staff's research has confirmed there was a Perosi at that time who was in her early thirties. I suppose this case will take some time to investigate. How will you go about it? I wanted to contact the real Perosi, but it seems the whole colony disappeared one night. September 29th, 1915, during a hurricane. I will have to take it slow and figure out what this spell of impersonation could have been. Oh, I'm sure it will all clear up eventually. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Ruth Talon, 29 years of age. Reason for admission? Uh, Ruth's father wishes that his daughter be removed from New Orleans nightlife for the foreseeable future. He fears that her overly free spirit is tarnishing the family's reputation. Sounds simple enough. Personal history? Ruth comes from considerable wealth. Her family owns several hotels and restaurants. Unlike the rest of the family, her sense of adventure has taken her around the world, including France during the Great War as a photojournalist. The last decade, she has provoked many rumors of being a debauched flapper, bordering on nymphomania. And diagnostic impression? Despite her father's frivolous reasons for her to be admitted, Ruth does seem to provide an interesting case. She is refreshingly open and doesn't shy away from talking about her life during the war or her continuous celebration after returning to the States. She is admittedly a sexual deviant and feels no remorse. And her treatment plan? Simply staying at Dorsetto should do wonders for Ruth. If not, at least for her family's reputation. Ruth doesn't need to change, but with therapy I might be able to share with her some sympathy towards her family. I doubt she will settle down and become as dull as the rest of them, but at least she might try to be more discreet in the future. Looks like all the patients are accounted for. Except for Jeremy. Lost Plantations of Louisiana, Thierry Bricklow, 1917. The Assetto was a small plantation on the eastern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. The land was considered difficult for industry and was sold for only $30 to Elijah Pickford in 1818. Pickford employed hundreds of workers from nearby New Orleans to clear the woods and build a small plantation mansion facing the lake with a striking Greek Revival temple facade. 
Desato kept a modest production of Perique tobacco and indigo that persisted up till the Civil War. During the antebellum era, Desato was the source of many rumors concerning voodoo and witchcraft. People who traveled the lake reported seeing people dance at night in front of bonfires, bleating and wailing. On June 17, 1862, Captain J.W. Norton of the Union Army recounts leading a raiding party from ships anchored in Lake Pontchartrain in order to seize control of Desetto and free the slaves working there. The captain was surprised to find the workers fighting back with unprecedented zeal. Norton's account describes these men and women as enraged with fanaticism. Pickford reportedly tried to placate the raiders, but was shot in the confusion. Captain Norton left the mansion burning and retreated to his ships with his men. Their seto was left in ruins for several decades. The ownership of the land was long disputed and returned to the Ledoux family in 1901. Several police reports were filed during the following years as the Ledoux tried to get rid of a camp of squatters on their land. The police made several visits to remove the trespassers, but the people kept returning. On November 1, 1907, Inspector Legrasse of the police charged a deadly attack in order to save several children kidnapped by the squatters. Many were killed, and even more were jailed. The following year, Ledoux rebuilt Desato, incorporating the surviving stone foundation and adding a magnificent wrought iron conservatory. The farmland had been reclaimed by the surrounding woods, so it was no longer profitable to use as a plantation. Instead, the house was turned into an artist's colony. The Astarte Artist Colony was a successful group of artists, including figures such as painter Heinrich Cassel and poet Nora Keith. The group was also known for their beloved Mardi Gras crew called the Pirates of Pontchartrain. On September 29, 1915, a tropical hurricane tore through Louisiana, causing Lake Pontchartrain to flood New Orleans. Due to the remote location of their settle, it took almost two weeks for outsiders to learn that the artist's colony was abandoned. The twelve residing artists had all vanished without a trace. The empty mansion of Der Seto still stands on the shore of Lake Pontchartrain, with much of its temple facade intact. The Ledoux family currently has no intention of repairing the house. Wedge shot. What happened? Everything's normal again? Right.
This can't be real. like some kind of rot. This must be the clock that Jeremy wrote about in the commonplace book. Huh. Looks like the plate that held the talisman in the seance room. But it's broken and missing some pieces. If it wasn't for the collection of peculiar statues, the old astronomical clock would draw every eye in the room. To Kambi, it wasn't the intricate clockwork that stood out, but the odd-looking plate on the inside. It reminded him of the ritual bench in Miss Jackson's seance room, where he had manipulated the talisman to open a door back to DeSetto. He wanted to try to replicate the procedure, but found that the inner part of the plate was broken. He would have to find the missing pieces and put the plate back together. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry, detective. Didn't mean to obstruct justice or anything. That's fine. You know, I'm kind of busy with my own case of a missing person. I, I was wondering if you've seen Grace, girl about yay high. I can't say that I have. Why are you asking? Well, I'm looking for her. Is she in trouble? No, 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 no. Uh, she's just uh, hiding somewhere. But we can't have a rascal like that running around unchecked at a time like this, you understand? Well, I haven't seen her. Well, let me know if you find her. I'll be around. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for your man, Jeremy. You scratch my back, Detective. I'll scratch yours. McCarthy reminded Detective Comby of an old barfly he used to know. He detested him. There was no getting around it. McCarthy was going to have a hard time getting on his good side.
like everything's back to normal here. Emily's here. Centric. I did it! I crossed the thresholds to my intended destination without a focusing device. My talisman now knows these roads, and I have no need for the plates. I can find my way to Lafayette as easy as I find my own room. I visited the grave of my father and seen the oven waiting for me. Thank you for opening these doors. I now must summon my courage and go back to that hateful mound outside the oil rig. I hope you'll be feeling better when I return. Jeremy. What are these symbols? Looks like alchemy or star constellation. Will I need to remember how to get them out again? They are locked up for good reason. I am sure she is still able to whisper the answer in the ears of the wrong people. But not for long. I will see her burn soon enough. That black goat will be sacrificed to put an end to it all. Then it will all be over. No more Derseto, and sadly no Astarte. Those good pirates of Pontchartrain. May you still sail the lake until you find the shores of Hali. Paintings got some grim looking rot on them. Hmm. The Astarte Artist Colony. I remember hearing about their disappearance. Must have been 15 years or more now.
Detective Conby had a hard time understanding what had happened. It did feel similar to when he was pulled into the French Quarter, but with less power and purpose. Did he cause this, or was it something else? What the hell is going on? You know, Mr. Waits, I saw a piece of the plate that Liza broke. I think she's been hiding them. She's not very good at it. She just chucked it into the little room with all the tools behind the boiler. I left it there. I didn't want to embarrass her by picking it up while she was looking. We went upstairs instead and played backgammon. I let her win, because she's so unhappy. The piece looked like the one on display in Cassandra's room. You know about that one already, right? Or is your eyesight really that fuzzy? I hope you don't feel bad about your glasses. You only look stupid when you squint. Maybe if you had more eyes, you would see these things. I wish you had all the eyes you needed. Your best and favorite guest, Grace. It's another plate for the talisman. Like the other one, it's broken. Missing some pieces. There's something missing. Doing in my kitchen, I assure you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I promise I didn't, you, I, Mr. Hartwood is nowhere near my for... kitchen, and neither should you be. Don't make I, me I kick you out to... of this house. Sorry. Now get out. Yeah. Conby was in shock, but also a little embarrassed. The housekeeper was furious to find him searching through the kitchen, and had run him out of the room. There was something strange going on with her, but it didn't feel connected to the case, so he decided to stay out of her way.
think I've seen this somewhere. something in the commonplace book about it. Picture in the black glass, it's showing me something. It's the hallway outside Jeremy's room. As his pride faded, Detective Comby was left with a feeling of unease. He had successfully managed to enter a whole new world. How could this be, and why did he accept this so readily? One thing was clear. There were no answers to be found by standing around questioning reality. Knowing only what he read in the commonplace book, Comby headed off to look for Jeremy in the hateful mound. Huh. I made it. I entered another one of Jeremy's memories. Ugh. May 1923, Monday. All okay, ready for delivery. Maintenance, oil pump must be serviced. Any tampering causes large spills unless properly forestalled. Tuesday, shipment delayed but delivered. Maintenance, service bridge close to broken. Wednesday, prospectors reluctantly agreed to show the burial mound to Mr. Hotwood, a painter, who read about our finds in the papers. He means to return tomorrow and try to find a way inside. Thursday. Mr. Hartwood's efforts delayed. The workers seemed nervous about his presence. Mr. Hartwood promised not to return to the compound. Instead, he has taken up an offer by L'Officier, the riverboat captain. He means to pilot him to the site tomorrow morning. Hopefully, that's the end. Work can resume. Maintenance. The bridge from the oil tower to the bayou has collapsed. Sabotage suspected. This is the devil that guides us now. Huh.
Pretty weak. I just need something to break. It.
There's gotta be a way to get to the other side. the hateful mound Jeremy talked about in his book. Don't come any closer. I'm armed. Now get that thing out of my face. Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm just a detective trying to find something called Tarawea. You after Jeremy too? Why? I'm working for his niece. She wants to make sure he's all right. He might be unharmed, but far from all right. He's a curse upon DeSeto. Oh, here we go again. Quiet. Reflections on the Power of the Verb in Certain Texts by Juan Luis Jorge To act is in itself divine. Even the slightest movement of our hand is evidence of our soul in motion. 
Yet our free will is so easily overwhelmed by the dullness of everyday life. Our actions become rote and rigid in spite of luxury and comfort. True divinity is found in the choice of leaving the stage where we all perform. People who discover this freedom unexpectedly will be struck by the terror of this revelation and become paralyzed, or worse, turn to suicide. However, if you are able to weather that storm, you will discover that there is a divine path beyond that fear. There is a chance to dismount your destiny and make something new. Something that hasn't been planned for or predestined. There is difficulty in explaining this type of acting as it transcends our everyday choices. This isn't some banal decision choosing one career over the other, or even who I should marry. Leaving the stage, no matter how, isn't a matter of course correction. It's a rejection of the story that the creator is telling. It was a bust. The oil rig and the hateful mound led him nowhere closer to finding Jeremy. Combe was sure he had struck gold when he found Jeremy's bag, but it was just a trap set by Lottie, another of DeSetto's orderlies. Things got out of hand real quick, but somehow Combe managed to find his way back to DeSetto, none the wiser. At least it was one item off his list. Now he had to figure out what to do with the boiler. It's wedged shut. It worked. The Barlow Lens. Instructions. To double the magnification of your telescope, simply fit this Barlow Lens to your instrument. Then operate the fine tuners to adjust the distance between your lenses. This is easily done while looking through your eyepiece. Simply search for a position where your picture is clear and appears flat. When correctly tuned, your telescope should present a clear picture with magnificent magnification. The lone and the lost walk a land of fear. When there is nothing you recognize, or no one to trust, you prepare for the worst. Something is coming, and you best be ready. Take the gun in the parlor. Give them hell. What's this? Now we're talking.
there's something missing. This must be that kid's room. Don't you worry, Grace. Go play your game, bleat and bellow with the others. I won't be jealous. There will be more masquerades. However, I would love it if you would finish my mask for the feast. With love, Ruth. Why does she seem so familiar? What you got there? You drawing something? Nothing special. I'm just bored. Do I know you from somewhere? I remember you, Mr. Conby. From where? Don't touch that. Cassandra wouldn't like it. She wouldn't like it at all. Do you know where she is? I'd rather not talk about it. It makes me upset. Besides, she'll be back after the Feast of St. John. You think? Yep. It's all on the page, Mr. Conby. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. All right. I'm going to go now, if that's okay. I don't like to stay too long in the same place. Mr. McCoffee might find me. Hey. Was he mean to you? Not everyone needs to be saved, Mr. Conby. You should know that by now. Why did that girl look so familiar? Detective Comby just couldn't quite remember. His last few years were clouded by a drunken haze. A haze which now had turned almost opaque. Considering their shared past, Grace had every right to feel slighted. But it wasn't in her nature. She was amused. Miss Beauregard, I picked up your medicine at the post office today. As you understand, it needs to be administered by the orderlies for your safety. I have put the box in Lottie's room for now, and I'm sure she will find you as soon as possible. Mr. Waits. So this is where Cassandra Beauregard ended up. For some reason, I... She died years ago. It's another one of those strange padlocks.
worked. Jeremy? What the hell is going on here? Where's the body? Conde didn't know what to make of the grotesque vision of the dead clerk. Was he dead, or was it all fiction? went shut. It worked. Detective Conby, how good of you to come. Let me pour you a drink. What happened here? This place looks like it was hit by a bomb. <laughs> Welcome to the madhouse, Detective. Thanks. Did the ceiling just collapse? I heard it was something in the attic. Something that was supposed to happen, but didn't. How that could have such consequences is beyond me. The truth is, I don't know why the room looks like this. 
but I bet your friend Jeremy does. You know where I could find him? Oh, somewhere in his past, I suppose. He keeps going on about that mysterious dark man. I think he is hiding from him. Or maybe he's with him. I can't really keep up. I don't worry much. Take a look around this room. You may think it looks spectacularly devastated, but I just think it's finally found its stride. <laughs> it fits perfectly with the state of this place and its loonies. The same goes for the nonsense with Jeremy. In my eyes, we finally managed to match the wild ride inside all of us. Well, I'm happy you find the evening so harmonious. I, uh... Hope you don't mind me setting things right. Jeremy's business, that is. This room looks beyond my capabilities. Good luck, detective. Hope to see you again soon. Yeah. Evening, miss. Ruth seemed like a handful. Her talk about Jeremy and the Dark Man made it sound like she might know something of importance. But ultimately, it felt like a dead end. Can I get some more of that whiskey? Go ahead, Detective. I don't think I can stomach any more anyway. Am I bothering you? On the contrary, Detective. I enjoy watching professionals at work. Well, I better get going. Bye now, Detective. Don't take any wooden nickels. As the world moved into the new decade, America was spiraling into a maelstrom of debt, drought, and death. It was called the Great Depression and ruined many families. It was a fitting name, for poverty also breeds madness through desperation. Jeremy was of course no such victim, for he already witnessed the darkness within. He knew the shadow that stood on his threshold very well. It wasn't new. It was something that had always been with him.
It's guiding me to do something, but what? The rot made the shape of a snake. There must be something important to find here. Maybe it has something to do with the numbers on the label. another piece of broken plate. The medicine bottles had stains of rot on the labels, suggesting some greater shape. They just needed to be put in the right order. But for what purpose?
that's a show. Another room. Must be a way to another one of Jeremy's memories. Getting good at this, Carnby. I know I'm too good at this. The odious stench of a flooded cemetery caught him off guard. It was one of the many things that clued Detective Carnby in on that this place wasn't the real thing. This was some nightmarish surrogate patched together by Jeremy's tattered memories. This is why we bury above ground, he thought, and set off to find the chapel that Jeremy had mentioned. Hartwood's family crypt. Emily's family must have deeper roots in New Orleans than I thought. I figured she was a Yankee like me. this now what do we got here <sighs> got it It was the chapel Jeremy had mentioned in his book. With a bit of luck, soon Combe would be able to catch up with the old man. He just needed to find a way inside the chapel.
It's blocked.
that's over. This doesn't look good. Please don't touch her. Jeremy, what are you doing here? Everyone's looking for you. I know, it, it's all a big mess. No one understands. I, I'm just trying to keep evil at bay, just for a little while longer. You've got to come back with me. Your niece is waiting at Dorsetto. Emily? Why would she? My letter. I keep making it worse. What is going on, Jeremy? How is any of this happening? I made, I made a terrible promise with someone. The Dark Man. Who is he? No, 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 don't say his name. He can hear us. He's always listening. Jeremy, I need to understand what is going on. I promised him everything. When the sun rises, I will be chained in his sunken desert temple for an eternity. But at least the evil about to awaken in Desetto won't harm anyone outside of that cursed place. You're acting crazy, Jeremy. I want to help. There's nothing you can do. Then what's all the business about Teruea? Why did you want to go there? Oh, I can't go there. Not allowed. But you wanted to. Can I go? Tell me, will it help me to break your pact? Is there something there that would help? Why would you give me hope? That's so cruel. Okay. Sounds like we're onto something here. What should I- Look out! Behind you! What? Run! Don't let him take you! I've seen so many strange occurrences lately. Memories explode into existence and then burn out like tide glass bulb filaments. Dreamscapes crash down from the stars and sink into the sea. Doors that lead to nowhere and absolutely everywhere at once. With all this reverie, I want to think there's a chance that you found a way to remain alive in some way I cannot fathom. Just like I've learned to navigate with my talisman. Maybe you, with all your knowledge, you somehow knew a way. A way to find me again, perhaps in Teruaya. Oh, my love. Jim.
Jeremy didn't want to be saved. He felt the need to honor some deal he made with an entity called the Dark Man. Combi wanted to think it was ridiculous, but a brief encounter with that unbearable bloom had shaken him to his core. Combi had seen a lot of bad things in his life, but he had never before been this terrified. After gathering his thoughts, Conby figured he would need to chase after Jeremy in the only place left he could think of. He needed to go to Tarawea. She's dead. How she died, she looks peaceful now. Perusi's body looked unharmed. Conby couldn't figure out how she died, or why this wasn't a bigger upset to the people at the Seto. Jeremy had found a way to enter Terrawea, but he wasn't allowed to go. He knew deep down that it was impossible for him to cross that threshold. Instead, he hoped that Perosi would go in his place and burn his library to the ground so he could start again. But she never got the chance. Perosi had her own problems, her own demons, and she died suddenly one day without warning. Holding the telescope lens in his hands, Detective Combe suspected what it was, at least a part of the key to that paradise Jeremy so desperately wanted to see. Curious what he would find, he felt eager to put the lens to use. Something missing. more of that aggressive rot. On the commonplace of evil, there lies virtue and stark irreverence, careless thoughts of luminous indifference. But blame not the beast we once were, which science so often wished to refer. Not the wicked full of sin, it is you who stand and grin. All our good intentions aside, whereupon we build our pride. Sunless solitude, follow not this corrupting light. Prophets of confidence always crashes out of sight. Hear me, for we all bear this mark. Thus we must remain alone in the dark.
What's going on? It's dialing in something all on its own and it's showing the way to another memory? Where is that? Another world seeping into Deceto. Was this a taste of that mysterious Terrawea? go. I'm glad to see you made it. I had my doubts, but the hope you instilled has yet abandoned me. I guess this must be Tarawea. Who are you? My name is Juan Luis Jorge, and this is indeed the convent of Tarawea. You'll have to excuse me, but Yermi never got your name. The name's Edward Carnby. I'm a private investigator. You're not a patient, are you? No. I'm the author of a book that Yermi once found important. How does that work? Are you part of this memory as well? Is this even a memory? I think calling me a manifestation of Yermi's subconscious would be more correct. And so is the convent of Tarawea. I'm a man Yermi has never met. And we are in a place that he has never been. Okay. So are you here to guide me or something? I have no more purpose than you do. I simply am. I will happily help you, of course, if I'm able. If you are already somehow part of Jeremy, why did he want to come here? Isn't he sort of here already? Jeremy wanted to come here because it's a representation of his mind at peace. When Dr. Gray asks him to find his focus during his sessions, this far-flung convent is what Jeremy imagines. He is under the impression that if he could physically come here, he would reach a perfect equanimity. A spiritual apotheosis. You don't think it would work? Jeremy subconsciously knows it's just wishful thinking. He can't come here. Despite the pathways opened by the dark man between their seto and Jeremy's psyche, it's simply not possible. But I'm here. <laughs> Indeed. It's a shame it's just another place for you, detective. Otherwise, you could have become a Buddha. Always a bridesmaid, never a blushing bride. Am I right? <laughs> yes, I suppose so. You'll have to chase enlightenment elsewhere. So what's the next best thing? What can I do here? You should seek out the convent library and try to find the truth about Yermi's relationship with the Dark Man. It's the sort of knowledge he represses and is unable to reflect on. Will it tell me how to break the pact? Perhaps. At least you'll have something to confront Yermi with. Wait, why can't you just tell me? I don't know such things. You'd be better off consulting the text of Dr. Freud, if you want such answers. <laughs> no thanks, I hate shrinks. There is another thing you should know about the library. He is here as well. The Dark Man has been working his way through the text for a long, long time. He's here? How am I supposed to get past him? Be careful, detective. Oh, jeez. Just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> 